Okay, all right. I want to talk to you today about, uh, first of all, if you have your treasure map, I'd like you to take your treasure map out. We're going to find some treasure. I, I got you a Bible in my office and I still haven't got it in your hands yet. I'm going to get it to you. All right. I mean, people got their phones. I mean, I, I will allow phones or anything. But anyway, that's what we're doing. We're here to get out our treasure map so we can find some treasure. Okay. Why well, I'm looking over there. Today, I want to talk about where does milk and honey come from. Milk and honey. I don't even like honey, really. But that's not what it's saying. Milk and honey. It's a term used in the Bible whenever you were trying to say something about a place that was like it was popping and dropping. Ain't no stopping. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? No? Well, that was God's slang term. Milk and honey for like everything you need is in there plus some. Where does milk and honey come from? A cow and a bee, dummy. <laughs> Exodus 3. Is that 3? 317? Yeah, I guess that's right. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Parasites. I call them parasites. <laughs> I accidentally did. <laughs> the oh. Hivites and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now that's odd. I'm going to take you down here to the, uh, you know, this country over here where it's like uh, filled up with all these folk. But the land is beautiful and it's good. Is it? Yeah. I think it is. Can anybody hear me? I can turn my stuff up now. I turn it down over here. I can hear you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. If you need me to talk louder, then let me know. Um, yeah, let's keep moving. I'm scared this sermon ain't going to be that long. I might go slower and talk like <laughs> this, like I'm from Alabama. <laughs> I am from Alabama. Yes, I am. From Montgomery. I came from Montgomery, born at St. Margaret's Hospital. To... Uh, they, you know, people in Montgomery, they, they would turn around and say, where are you from? I was like, what? I'm from here, man. Where you <laughs> anyway, do you notice that God said, I'll promise? Just God talking. And I promise. You ever had a God make you a promise? And we have people make us promises. And mm-hmm. 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 Look at this. God said, I'll promise. Promise I'll bring you out of the affliction of Egypt. You know what Egypt is? That's Pharaoh. You know who Pharaoh is? The devil. God said, I will come and get you out of Egypt where you are a slave under the devil, Pharaoh, and I will bring you out and I will put you over here in a land that has milk and honey and it's got all these parasites. But it's got the milk and honey. God said, I'm going to come and scoop you out. Of, I will get you out of Egypt, out from under the bondage of Pharaoh, and I'll stick you in this land over here. That's pretty cool. That's God doing the thing. But notice how God said, I am not going to take you from Egypt and stick you into the kingdom. See, later comes a kingdom king david and solomon and all the kings and there's a kingdom but god doesn't start them from egypt to a kingdom there's something in the middle and so the kingdom to us would be like heaven god takes us and saves us out of egypt which is the picture of the world and pharaoh is a picture of the devil and god saves us and he doesn't just say okay now go to heaven that'd be like a mean saying go to heaven <laughs> That'd be cool. Hey, go to heaven. <laughs> we should start that and see what happens. And um, there's something in between. Why does God take me out of Egypt and he don't let me come live with him? Because he said there's something for you to do first. There's something between you getting saved out from under Pharaoh and going into heaven 
It's called the promised land. It's the land of promises. God makes you all these promises, but in the promised land there are parasites. We're talking about where does milk and honey come from? Now, um, Jesus, when he rose up from the dead, the first question they asked him was, are you going to restore the kingdom now? And he said, no, go fight. Huh? He, what? Go fight? Yeah, there's something I need you to do between now and then. That's what's happening right here. So this Bible is a picture book. The things that we learn in our gospel are in picture form in the Old Testament. God would make a picture like the tabernacle that's out in the wilderness. Every piece of that tabernacle was a picture of Jesus. Everything. All the way down to the little, um, the way the gold rings were holding the curtains and the way the curtain was and the way the inside and the thing, the washing bowl and the whole thing, the bread and the, and, and, and the holy of holies. And they had the, the, the altar burning all the time of incense and they had the showbread for the priest. And no one could eat that. And so everything is a picture. So the picture in here is, are we going to go to the kingdom now that I'm saved? No, go fight. Get in the promised land. Pick a fight with some giants because you have milk and honey waiting for you. Now that you're saved and you've come out from the hand of Pharaoh, now God has a plan for you. He's going to stick you in this place over here and now he tells you to fight for it. He didn't have you fight your way out of Egypt. You couldn't have done anything. God just took you right on down, just saved you and pulled you right out of Egypt. Now he said, now I got something for you to do. Here, take this sword. You're like, what? I didn't use it on Pharaoh. No, don't use it on Pharaoh. Use it on these giants. Okay, so Jesus said, no, I'm not restoring the kingdom. You go fight. So when we leave Egypt and we go to the promised land in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that's the picture of us being saved and then moving into what the Bible calls sanctification. So there's salvation when you get saved, then there's sanctification, that's you being walking with God, being changed into his image, and then there'll be glorification whenever your body changes to go to heaven. So the picture in the Old Testament, Egypt into the promised land, you being saved, going into sanctification, which is where you live for God. Watch this. Where milk and honey is. What? You mean there is a promise that I can preach prosperity? That if you get saved, God has for you milk and honey in your life. And he wants it to flow and flow and flow. He wants you to receive that blessing. He wants like a father to give that to his child and his child to enjoy an everlasting flow of milk and honey because you have been pulled out from the hand of Pharaoh and you've been made a child of God. But he put you over here in a land that has milk and honey. But in that land are parasites. They're giants. They're Canaan, Canaanites who worship the devil. They're, Canaan, they're, they're Perizzites and Hittites and uh, Hivites and whoever they are. They are anti-God. And so now God is telling them your assignment is twofold. Milk and honey and the giants. This land that they're going into is occupied by giants and God said, that's your land and I want you to kick them out. And you're like, well, why didn't you kick them out? You kicked Pharaoh's face in pretty good, but now you want me to kick somebody's face in. Okay. Okay, that's what he's saying. Let me show you. Land of flowing milk and honey. What's our assignment again? Milk and honey. When you get saved, your assignment is to let the milk and honey in your life begin to flow. You've got to let it flow. It's a promise. God's taking you to milk and honey. But there are giants in the land that don't want you to have your milk and honey. So you've got to cut their heads off. Okay, Let's look at this. To have milk and honey flow in your life, you're going to have to, let's go back to the picture in the beginning and see how they were able to get the milk and honey to flow in that land. And you'll know how to get it to flow in your life. Look at Numbers 33. 
verse 51 through 53. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy Whoa. all their metal images yeah. and demolish all yeah. their high places. All right. And you shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. Jump down to 55. But if you do not drive out the uh -oh. inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them who let you remain shall be as barbs in your eyes Pricks. and thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. I like King James because it calls them, instead of thorns, it says pricks, and I like to call them, they're going to be a bunch of pricks. I didn't say it, King James translating. Sense. But anyway, look what happens. God said, I want you to go in this land. I, put, I gave you this land over here. As soon as you cross that water, you start kicking them out. Okay? I want you to kick them out because if you do not drive them out from before them then, and you let them stay, they're actually going to be thorns in your eyes and what does it say? In your side. Your eyes and your side. You know what thorns are. So you're telling me, God, that you have made me a land over here that's so wonderful. I'm going to go in there and have it. And the only way that you want me to uh, get it is to just take the people that are there and remove them, everything that they have. Every movie theater, every poster, every song, every radio station they have, everything. Clean the whole land completely out so God can be here. Give me the next one, Exodus 34. Now look at what we're doing. We're talking about how do you have the milk and honey flow in your life? Well, the first picture was they had to go into the land and they have to clean it out. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, oh, he will the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their Asherim, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice. I don't know what y'all are doing, but um, you heard most of it. I don't know what's not working on the screen and what you're saying. But uh, either way, I need you to hear what I need you to hear what God is saying right here is, is uh, to have milk and honey flow. They have to kick these things out because if not, look what's going to happen. If you just give them grace, if you just say, listen, I'll just be here. You take this little spot over here. God already knows that eventually you're going to work your way over there and make friends. One day you're going to start trading some food. One day you're going to make nice. One day you're going to need something. They're going to give it to you. And you're going to start making friends. And the next thing you know, you're going to let your daughter marry them. And then their, their son can, you know, their daughter can marry your son. And then before you know it, you're mingling with them. And before you know it, you're mingling with them. Now you're worshiping their gods and you're doing their things. And God said, that's unacceptable. Kick them out because if not, you're going to make agreements with them and you're going to live with them and they're going to stop your milk and honey. Okay, I just wanted y'all to see the instructions. Let's keep going. All right, so like Jesus did, that's how we go through the land of our life. Once we get saved, now let's look at Jesus' picture. Now let's move from the Old Testament and move to the New Testament where Jesus came. Do you know that Jesus' name is Joshua? Yah Yah Yashua, Yashua is a form of Joshua. So Joshua, Jesus is a picture of Joshua. Jesus is a picture, of, no, sorry. Moses is a picture of Jesus. Joshua is a picture of Jesus. King David is a picture of Jesus. King Solomon is a picture of Jesus. And so we have all these pictures. Um, Jesus is a picture of how we now clean out the land. Look how when Jesus got here as Joshua, he started cleaning out the land. Let's look at 1 John 3, 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Here reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Can you read that last sentence again? 
The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now read it again. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. One more time. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I thought he was here to love everybody. Well, love can't flow if the devil's here. So first thing he's going to do, he's going to walk around, he's going to start pow, 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 bang, boom, pow. You're blocking the milk and honey. You're blocking the milk and honey. You're blocking. You're blocking. You're blocking. Everybody in here blocking. That's what he came to do. Destroy the works of the parasites. Give me the, oh, well, give me the next Mark 16. Now look at Jesus. He's given us the assignment now to go clean out the land like he did. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Are you going to restore the kingdom? No. Go into all the world and beat up all those parasites so that milk and honey can flow. Go. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. There they, go. they will speak in new tongues. There it is. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any, any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. That's Jesus who just went through the land showing us how to clean it out. There's a blind man, there's a sick man, there's a demonized little kid, there's a demonized person over there. The bang, boom, pow, he's just cleaning it all up. And now he's like, your turn. I want you back there, Miss Lady, in the back row. I want you to get in that fight. I want you to go clean them parasites out. Give me that last verse in Acts 3, 6. I want you to see what it looks like. But Jesus came, showed us what he did, then he gave us the uh, command, now you go do it, now here's somebody doing it. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and There walk. he is, he was a fisherman. This guy was a fisherman, that's all he knew. But then Jesus came and showed him how to clean the land out, and the next thing you know, this dude's like, hold up, I ain't got no money for you, partner, but here, grab his hand right here, I'm finna give you what I got. Whoop! You know my favorite part of this story is? They always seen this guy at this door. 38 years he sat there at that door. Even while Jesus walked back and forth, he still never got healed and sat at that door. Then one day, Peter's coming. He's walking by. Dude's looking for money. Peter looks over and he says, Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I give it unto you. Pulls him up. His ankles receive strength. He jumped up and bounced around, went into the temple where they were, and everybody said, what? That's the... That's the guy that's been sitting outside 38 years. And then they look over at Peter, and Peter said, don't look at me. Don't look at me like I did anything. Like it was my power or my holiness. Can you hear that? You're qualified because Jesus qualifies you to do it. You get to say, not by my power. It's not my holiness. I didn't earn this. I'm not so holy I get to lay hands on people and you don't. We're all qualified to lay hands on the sick and to speak in other tongues and to clean out the land and to do what he said. You got to believe that. You got anything over there? What you got? What did your Mark 16, 15 through 18 say? That's why I would be more interested in. He who has believed in me and has been baptized will be saved from the penalty of God's wrath and judgment. But he who has not believed will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. You all do any of that? That's what we're supposed to be doing. If you need milk and honey to start flowing in your life, here's what I want you to do. Start doing what Jesus did. Start destroying the works of the devil. That picture is in the Old Testament when Joshua went into the land and he had to destroy the works of all those parasites. Tear down their altars, tear down their thing, tear down their... 
everything they got, burn them and kill all the children. People use that against God all day long. You can get on the internet and people who hate God, they'll use that. Well, did you see this story here in the Old Testament when God went in there and wiped out all the people and even the animals and the children? Uh, yes, I have. And you don't care about it? I do not. Because I'm on board. I signed up and I ain't never signing off. It's, it, it's a picture, though, about how God is serious about cleansing out the land. You know what the land represents? You and your life. You have to clean it out. When you get saved, now you have a promise of milk and honey that will flow, but you also have an assignment that there are parasites in your life that are going to stop that. And if you let them stay, then you're going to start agreeing with them. You're going to start agreeing with doubt and fear and worry. You just let it stay. You just let fear go. And then you push it down one time so you can keep living. But then it pops back up and, you, and you're just fighting all these different things in your life. You don't have any milk and honey flowing. You see, some Christians, they got milk and honey flowing. You see, other ones are always fighting something. God said, cut his throat. All right, let's move on. Giants are bred for us. That's what the Bible says. That's what Joshua said. Let's look at Numbers, baby. Numbers 14. I want you to listen to what Joshua said. Now watch what happened. Joshua went in the land and he came back out and everybody, all the people went with him and said, we can't go back in there. The land was just like God said, but look at all those people in there. They're going to be too tough. So here's Joshua when they start coming, talking about, here, just read it. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? See? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back Gosh. to Egypt? What a dummy. So he, they basically said, once they went and looked at the land, uh, they said, God brought us out here to die by these people. They're going to kill us. Every person in there, they're going to take our wives and our children, and they're going to just murder us. Shouldn't we just, shouldn't we just stay in Egypt? Man, what dummies. Go ahead, baby. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only See do what not they saw? Hmm. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of the <laughs> Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the people of Israel. So these two guys spoke up. They said, that's not true. We're not going to die. God will give us that land. It's got milk and honey. And it said that uh, uh, the people took up stones to kill him. Wow. But then God appeared. You have somebody about to take you down and God appears. <laughs> okay, so um, did you catch that they were bred for us? That's what Joshua said. Giants are bred for us. That means as you go off into your life to fight these giants, this fear, this unforgiveness, this hurt, the, everything that's in our life that breaks us, um, you can... Let me say it a different way. So your flesh then is the land. Let me say it that way. Your flesh is the land. You have to clean out your flesh. You have to clean out your flesh. You have to clean out your flesh where there's doubt, worry, fear, anger, rage, frustration, lust, murder, anxiousness, embarrassment. Just say and just name every worst thing you can think of. That's in your body keeping the flow away. 
So let's look at what they were just talking about, how Moses sent them into the land to see what God had given them. And then they came out and gave the report that we just read. But let's read them going into the land. Numbers 13, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. Verse 17 through 20. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up into the land, go up into the Negeb and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak whether they are few or many and whether land they dwell in is good or bad and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds and whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are trees in it or not be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes all right, finish it up with 25 to 33. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from spying out the there land. There it is, 40 days of spying out this land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran. And here they come, Kadesh. bringing back the word. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and yep. this is its fruit. However, the people However. who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of the Anak there, that Amal Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negeb, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along it's the Jordan. Full of parasites. You still going? Uh, that was it. 33? 30 to 33. It's 25 oh, to 33. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy Whoa. it, for we are well able to Whoa. come to it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Mm. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land mm. they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there he was, the Nephilim, the son of Anak, who came from Nephilim. Ooh. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, so we seemed to them. Those are giants in the land. There are real giants. So can you imagine there would have been a city, AI was a city, that's weird, and they had a big, uh, like a nine-foot guy running the show, you know? They saw that. They were like, well, we're going to die. God said, go in there. I've given you all that. It's got milk and honey. Now kick them out. They're like, oh, look how big they are. We're just grasshoppers. And God said, that's an evil report. You being a grasshopper is an evil report. Well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And this thing's too big for me and that thing's too big. for you're, You being a grasshopper is an evil report. Do not ever impute to yourself being a grasshopper. You impute to yourself a bread eater. I eat giants. That's what I'm imputing to myself. That's what you're supposed to impute to yourself. What Jesus did, he was a, a giant eater. You know, David's brothers, whenever he went to fight Goliath, they called him a grasshopper. That's the same report they gave King David. You're just a grasshopper. You a grasshopper? <laughs> so how you see yourself is how the enemy will see you. Do you see yourself like a grasshopper? Then he'll see you like a grasshopper and he'll eat you up like a grasshopper. Do you see yourself like a bread eater? That's what David did. When David, King David walked up, he was a little puny, little, little nothing. All the guys in the big army outfits. He walked up and he was a bread eater. You guys are grasshoppers. I'm a bread eater. Where is that uncircumcised dog? Give me a sword. You're too little to even hold a sword, dummy. Yeah, well, give me a rock then. I'll, I'll swing this rock around and kill him. That's what Joshua thought. That's what Caleb thought. We can go in this land. God will just give it to us. 
And other people say, we can't do that. I want you to know when God tells you right now that to make milk and honey flow in your life, you have to go pick a fight with giants in there like hate. You know you have hate? I don't know. You might. Go look. Because it might be in you. But you can kick it out. And worry. And anxiousness. And lust. And a filthy mouth. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself weak and doubtful and fearful? You see yourself like a grasshopper? Then you will be a grasshopper. But if your self image is Jesus in you, Jesus in you, that's two things. You'd never be a grasshopper. All right, now let's get down and figure out, put it all together. Now we're trying to figure out where milk and honey flows. We've said a whole bunch of stuff. Let's tie it all together. Crochet it all together. My daughter's learning how to crochet. Look at this Revelation 21, 7 through 8. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Stop. So, the, uh, no, go on to verse 8. I want you to stop at verse 8. But now I they're going to tell us who is being thrown into the pit of hell. I want you to notice who the first two are. The, out of all the evil people who are going to hell, look at the first two people. They're unbelieving cowards. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, well, sorcerers, we get all that. idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which mm. is the second death. Duh! Except, go back to the beginning now. You mean the fearful and the unbelieving get thrown in f almost first. That's what these people are doing. God said, go in there and take that land. And you're like, I can't do that. I can't do that. God said, those are the first people being thrown into the pit of hell. The fearful, unbelieving sorcerers, idolaters, witches, and people that kill babies. <laughs> You don't get to live for God like a little puny old nothing. Amen. I'm just a grasshopper. You pray, you pray for me, you do the. I'm, I, listen, I, I am a, that's my job is to be the leader and pray for you guys. I have special whatever uh, assignment in the church to take care of the sheep. Do not cancel you. you. Let me pray for you all the time. Let me over pray for you. That's not what I'm saying. At some point in life, you need to be praying for your grandchildren and your children and people and all kinds of strangers and just in your life. You're doing it too. Because you're not a grasshopper. I'm not a grasshopper. I'm not a dog. That's what Goliath called them. A bunch of dogs. Um, Revelation 21, 8 said that the number one people going into hell or the fearful unbelieving. What was your two words you had in uh, 21 8? Revelation 21 8. First two words. I mean, the first two people being thrown into the lake of fire before the witches, the abortionists. But as for the cowardly and the faithful, the faithful. I'm asking Jordan which his two words he had. Hmm. That sounds like these people. Now, watch this. God saves you, and he wants you to go off in your life and get rid of all the fear. Get rid of all the doubt, all the anger, all the unforgiveness, because if not, it's just going to sit in there and soon you're going to be friends with it. And God ain't never going to be able to have his way with you. God said he wouldn't let Israel in. Let's look at Joshua 5, 6. This is God saying that he's, okay, then you bunch of cowards, you bunch of unbelieving people. Now I'm not going to let you in. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness Gosh. until all the nations, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Watch this. God takes them out of Egypt. They get to see God taking them out of Egypt with all that power. And he walks them through the desert. And they, all of them, none of them sick. 
all of them's got shoes and their clothes didn't wear out. Everything's fine. They're walking all the way to this promised land. God said, I'm taking you to a place. You're going to have your own stuff. And they get all the way up there. And right when they go in, God said, okay, now before y'all go in, send in 10 people and show and spy it out to just so you can know that it's exactly what I say. And when those 10 people came back, it's 12, 12 spies or 10 spies. Don't do this to me. It's just two of them. Two of them said this. It's perfect, y'all. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. And the other one was like, hey, oh, no, listen to them. No, no, do not go in there. Do not go in there. Whatever you do, there. our wives are going to die. Our children are going to die. These people are 10 foot tall. They got skyscrapers in here. Their cities are too big. We got nothing. Do not turn around and go back. God's like, really? You ain't going in. In fact, I'm going to stop you right here and you're going to march in a circle for 40 years. And when all of you die, everybody below the age of 20 dies, except for Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two. And it said when they were 85 years old, not one drop of their strength had gone so that they could go into the land. So Caleb and Joshua had to march around with them for 40 years. And when they all died, then God said, hey, it's time to go. Now that that generation that failed me died, let's take in this new generation into the land. That's in here. And the Bible says those things were written as an example for us. And how they failed in the wilderness because they complained always to God and they didn't trust God. And now we have Christians that complain to God and they don't trust God and they're just going around and around in the wilderness because they got no faith to go in there and chop the giant's head off so that milk and flunny, milk and flunny, milk and honey can flow. Flunny is hoeing. <laughs> honey. And flow together is funny. All right, I got you. Here's what I want you to know. There's a picture in here of people who won't believe God. And they suffer. And all he's trying to get you to do is go get the milk and honey that he's promised you. I need you to know that once you get saved, God has put out in front of you milk and honey. And your assignment is to get rid of the giants and you'll have that milk and honey. But people refuse to believe God. In fact, they won't even fight the giants at all. They don't even trust God enough to go into every battle and they would win. But that's what they were supposed to do. So we're going to wrap it up now. We won't make it uh, take all these pictures and put it to ourselves. Because now here's what happens. We have agreements with doubt and unbelief. And it stops the flow of God in our life. So now the giants in the land, you're the land. God lives in you. You're his possession. So while he's living in you, the land that God owns is you. And in the land, he don't want you having in your land, in his land, fear, idolatry, and witchcraft, and what all the sin, he, he wants you to clean all that mess out. And then if you do, the rivers of living water, the milk and honey will flow in your life. And before you know it, once I, once I got saved, my mind was so ghetto and broken and only thought certain ways. And so over time, God began to, the Holy Spirit flowing in my life, I began to get rid of certain ways of thinking. Get rid of believing in money. Get rid of believing in uh, um, life that comes from work. I should have got some of your attention. The just treasure map leads us not where it led them. We're not going to Kadesh Barnea to the Jordan. We. This leads my, my treasure map leads me to my treasure that's right here. The Bible says we have a treasure in earthen vessels. God has put a treasure inside of us. My treasure map leads me to my treasure. And my treasure will flow milk and honey if I will start attacking the things in my life. Let me just give you an example. 
Let's just say a man and a woman, they just start attacking the way they treat each other. You just start saying, you know what, I'm just going to, uh, we're going to change this house, baby. We're going to change this house because we're going to start talking to each other differently. We're just going to be different. Because there's something that's set up in their land that keeps the milk and honey from flowing. But if they'll go right in the land and just start cleaning it out, just put some love in there and get this anger out and this hurt and this un- just all that stuff. Just clean it out. Just clean it out. Baby, I love you. Let's get all this behind us. Let's just start talking to each other different. Let's start holding hands. Let me start opening the door for you again. Let me just start doing it. And what you just did was you start cleaning out. The giants, the brokenness, the things that are in the land that are there. And God said, if you'll do that, milk and honey is already just going to start flowing. You don't have to do anything. It's going to flow. The rivers of living water in you want to flow. But there's things in your land, parasites, that need to be cleansed out. You clean out some anger, you'll have a lot more peace. You clean out some greed, you'll have a lot more contentment. Contentment means you're just satisfied with whatever. If I had absolutely nothing, I'm totally fine. If I had everything, I'm totally fine. So remember, your treasure map leads you, us, not everybody in the Bible, but us. It leads us to the treasure that's in us. And if we want the treasure to flow, if we want the milk and honey to flow, there are things that are blocking it, and that's the enemies in your land. So go pick a fight with them. Like God will be with you. God said, I'll be with you. I'll drive them out. Unless you won't go in there to pick a fight. So Paul says that we cleanse ourselves out with the water of the word. And I guess now we're towards the end. Let me have that 2 Timothy 2.21. So here's how our treasure works. We've got to clean this out. These are my last two scriptures, I think, right? Mm-hmm. Listen, this is the end of the sermon. We looked at a picture in here about the promised land. I'm telling you now that the land is your flesh and you clean out your flesh of all these things that are not of God. And then God's power will flow through you. His wisdom will flow through you. The very gifts that he's given you will flow through you. If you get in there and here's what you do. You choose to pick a fight with things that are in your land. Just look around. What's in here? Just get it out. What if the secret to the blessing of God is not getting him to bless you, but it's to remove the things that stop the flow of blessing? That would be backwards in your thinking or our our thinking. God bless me. I need you to bless me. No, everything is in you to flow, but it won't flow out when it's all caked up. You know, just the word constipation comes to mind, but I'll move right on. Give me 2 Timothy 2.21 right here. Therefore, if anyone cleanse himself... Who cleanses who? Now look, Joshua said, go in the land and cleanse it. Now, all the way at the end of the Bible, now it's go into yourself and cleanse it. Go, read it again. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself... Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honor honorable use set apart as holy useful to the master of the house ready for every good work now guess where God fights God fights not like King David he fights now remember where your treasure leads you inside now God is inside of you fighting Every day you wake up, he's inside of you. He wants to fight that doubt that you have. He wants to fight that feeling that you have about your job. He wants to fight that feeling that you have about no peace in your house. He wants to, God's in you to fight that. God fights through you now. God fights through you now. So you have to make your vessel available to fight because if you're filled up with giants in the land and you're just too scared and hurt and angry and bitter and and then how's God fight through you he can't flow out of you if you're all constipated let me get this last one I got to say constipated twice in a sermon God fights through your vessel so you have to make it available let's read this last scripture babe now listen here's what I want you to hear now this scripture actually ties I just 
you saw that. But um, this scripture ties my whole sermon together. It takes the picture from the Old Testament and connects it to us cleaning out our flesh. Last scripture, then take the piano. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 7, 1. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer right. share Stop. with an unbeliever? That's kind of just a bunch of words. Listen, he's talking about a believer. A believer cannot just share life with the devil. We live with the devil out there. But we're not going to share life with him. How can a believer, is saying, share life with an unbeliever? How can light share with darkness? How can Jesus share with the devil? They don't mix. They don't mix. Sin in your life don't mix. It's never going to... Being a Christian trying to sin, it's not going to ever mix. Now watch this. Just like when God sent them in the land, he said you're never going to mix with them. Don't ever mix with them. The moment that you do, it's done. Now watch this. What agreement? The word accord here is the word agreement. What agreement do we have with these things that are not godly? Now move on to the one after that. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then God I will just said, you are now the temple. I'm going to get in you, and I'm going to walk inside you, and so don't you know you're a temple of the Holy Ghost? Therefore, get away from all those things that are not in agreement with God. Therefore, because God wants to be inside of you, all the agreements that you have has to go. Uh, be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. Gosh, I just really hate this version. Let's and go. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of Stop the body. Stop again. This is the last verse, by the way. Since we have these promises that God wants to be inside of us and wreck everything that's broken, since we have that promise, then do this. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and the spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Man. All right. That's it. Take the piano. I was telling y'all one week ago or however long that I went to Tupelo and got delivered. And I want you to see how I got delivered. I got delivered by imputing righteousness to myself. So I need you to take this Bible. So here, let me give you that example. The reason I said that, I want to give you this example of my daughters. Um, imputing righteousness to yourself is this. You're not a sinner anymore. You need to look in this Bible and see that God has changed you into some different creature and that creature is no longer a sinner. Just let your mind start wrapping around that. And then you'll be like, Okay, I'm totally lost then. How am I even, how do I even have the right to lie then if God made me a creature that's not a sinner? Then you get to go figure all that out. But like, what you do is you start imputing everything this Bible says, you just start imputing it to yourself whether you understand it or not. God says that you're righteous. And you're like, okay, I'm righteous. I'm righteous. I, I don't care what anybody else says or what I think. I'm righteous and I'm holy and I'm healed. And I'm healthy. And that's why I want you. That's just why I want to get to you today. My daughters live in, under my roof where they hardly never, ever get sick ever. And I mean never. Maybe they go visit their grandmother. And I like that because that strengthens their immune system. But anyway, but here's what's going to happen. One day I'm going to need them to start routinely imputing to themselves the health that God has in here. He's mentioned health in here for your journey. So what you do is you start imputing health to you every day. Just I mean, you can't do it every day. I mean, if you can do it every day, but if you, I don't do it every day. I routinely do it as much as I can think about it. Or if I'm ever, you know, if, if I ever have a thought that I don't have any insurance or anything, I think I have the best insurance. I'm on God's insurance plan. I'm on God's health plan. 
And uh, he don't ever have to spend any money at the hospital with me. So, but what I do is, watch what I'm doing. That's what it's like to take the Bible and begin to impute it to yourself. When I was imputing righteousness myself, I got delivered of a demon. When I was imputing that the cross makes me free from all the bad things I ever did, think about that. Like, nothing on this earth frees you from your bad decisions, your, bad, your mistakes. But the Bible tells me that what Jesus did for me absolutely frees me from every bad thing I've ever done. And so just, just imputing that to my, putting, imputing means putting, grabbing this and putting it in my bank account. Grab it and I am that then. Oh, and then I am this. You're this and this. Well, then I am that. I am free. I am pardoned. Pardoned. I had a judge pardon me. I knew what it meant. I've been pardoned by, by imputing pardoned. I'm pardoned. I'm, like, I'm just telling the devil I'm free from everything that I've ever done wrong that you're huge and against me. He left. Now watch this. I'm telling you how to keep imputing things. Impute help. Impute health to you. Just start telling. The Bible says I get to be healthy and strong. So I'm going to be healthy. And I'm imputing health. Just like you impute righteousness. Just like you impute I'm not a grasshopper. Impute that you're healthy. Because there's times when we impute healing to people. Well, this Bible says that by His stripes we're healed. So we lay hands on people. Well, that's not as good as being healthy. Healing is great. But healthy is the... I, I thought Greg would be here. I was going to prove that he's the new Kenny. Because I was going to say, get up here. He's going to say, I'm in the best health of my life. And I'm 70 years old. And I'm just living in divine health. And I'd be like, see, I'll just be pointing at him smiling. It's our new Kenny. Because that's how you get healthy. He'll tell you how to get healthy. But you know what he does? He imputes this divine health to him. And Kenny missed that part. I love Kenny. I don't. Hopefully you don't see none of that. We used to have a guy here telling us how to be youthful and live long and then through food. But now we have a new Kenny who tells you how to impute divine health to you. And then he'll tell you some cool food things. So he is, your mom and dad are the new Kenny and Sharon. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Here's one good thing I want you to hear about. There's more milk and honey left to flow in your life. Now, all you have to do to get that is just start with anything and get it out. God will be right there to help you pick a fight with that thing because he doesn't want it in his temple. He doesn't want you to have agreement with hurt and fear and brokenness and, and not enough and lack and poverty and all the things that are in there that are not in here. So start imputing the things that are in here and the milk and honey will start flowing and the things that are in your way. Like, let's say I impute that I, I have all things and you, you know you need some money. So instead of worrying about money, you just start going, but this Bible says that I don't have to worry about money. That God will take care of me like he takes care of the birds. Just start imputing that to yourself. Imputing it to yourself. Just imputing it, imputing, imputing. And that way, that's practicing your faith while you wait. I'm telling you how to practice the Bible, y'all, and it works. And milk and honey will just flow when you get those other things out. All right, here's my last example. So uh, me and my wife, we didn't start perfect, of course, I mean, with money and everything. You know, we, we're walking all this out. We're telling you as we do it, everything that works, we give it to you. And so money... Um, started flowing more when we got rid of worry about money. That's weird. Just, just the worry in itself causes you to do a thing that maybe somebody at rest wouldn't do. And so, so imagine if that flow of money that's here in my life now uh, kind of came from me releasing greed and worry and care just the whole idea of money and then there it was it wasn't like I needed God to give me more money and begging for money it's just me get, getting rid of things in me there that's it I said it that's the secret
just get rid of things in you and the, the thing will just, it'll come out your ears. So Father, we just heard the word today and we just prayed for Brendan as he, uh, whatever they do. But he's going to be healed because we believe this word and we impute to him the righteousness that's in here, the healing that's in here, the health that's in here. And we also impute it to ourselves. Father, we ain't never going to get that cancer on our neck. We ain't never going to get sick with cancer. We're going to live all the days of our life strong and healthy and not sick. All the way until the end. Because this Bible says that we have that promise. And I impute to every person in this room. I put it in your account. That God said you're going to be fine. And he's got everything planned for your life. He's got everything you need planned out. It's in a land of milk and honey. And all you have to do is go into that land. Fearless. Believing God. He will make sure everything that in your life will just flow. If you will just make sure to get rid of every parasite that's living in the temple of Almighty God. You are His temple. That's worry. That's cares of this world. That's anxiety. That's any problems that you have. Just start, just start talking to God about them. I make it sound so easy. Like, oh, just go get rid of that. Just go get rid of this. Listen, do this. Just start talking about it to God out loud. And then your words and he will be right there with you to even form what you're saying. Because you took the opportunity to bring up the conversation then God will take it from there and work it into a conversation and you will know something. Either you'll hear yourself say something you didn't know. I've done that a lot. When I first started, I'd go out and pray in English and I would say something that I needed to hear. It just came out of my mouth. Man, I'm trying to get this milk and honey to you. I do love milk. I'm trying to trying to like honey. Maybe I'll try it in the milk. Okay. Here you go.